Thank you, Richard, for those opening remarks. I uh, want to mm -hmm. welcome everybody here and obviously extend uh, congratulations to all the new IAFs. Uh, I think you're going to find it to be a life-changing experience. I know it certainly uh, changed the course of my life. Uh, we're very excited today to have Congressman Mike McCall. Uh, here is our guest. Uh, he is currently serving in his seventh term. Uh, as uh, representative of the 10th Congressional District in Texas. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with geography in Texas, let me sort of lay that out for you. The 10th Congressional District uh, runs from sort of the uh, suburbs of Houston all the way through, it includes Austin, it goes slightly north. So it's in some ways a microcosm of the United States. <laughs> uh, you have the suburbs of Houston, you have the high tech in Austin, you have small towns in between, places like Pflugerville and Sealy. Yes, that is the home of Sealy Mattress. It is. Uh, originally, it's a very diverse, yeah. uh, it's, it's a great place. Yeah. I used to live there. Uh, I'm a big fan uh, of it. And I'll also note that the 10th Congressional District is the seat that a young politician named Lyndon Baines Johnson held uh, mm -hmm. way back in the day. Now, as Richard mentioned, uh, Congressman McCall is Chairman McCall. He's the head of the, uh, Depart uh, the Committee on Homeland Security. He's headed that up since 2013. He is also a senior member on the Committee on Foreign Affairs. And you are a uh, member, actually you chair the U.S.-Mexico Interparliamentary Group. Mm -hmm. And I know tomorrow you're being honored by Ellis Island and receiving their Medal of Honor for your work on immigration. So let me just say congratulate Thank you on that. If everybody could join me in welcoming uh, the Congressman. Thank you. I'd say we have a, a full agenda of things we can discuss, sure. and uh, I'll pick it out of a hat. Let's start with Iran. Uh, obviously, this week, uh, the President announced that he was withdrawing the United States from the Iran nuclear deal. Uh, formerly known as the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action, or JCPOA. He took that step even though the U.S. intelligence community says that Iran has been complying uh, with the terms of the agreement. And he withdrew the United States even though three of America's closest allies, Britain, France, and Germany, uh, came up with a plan worked out in cooperation with Trump administration officials that addressed many of, though not all of the president's concerns, uh, about the deal. So did the president, in your view, make the right call? Well, let me first thank the Council on Foreign Relations. When I first decided to run for Congress, it was the first speech I gave. It was before CFR, you're a great resource uh, for us on the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, a great resource. And thank you for having me. And, and Jim, uh, I appreciate it. Uh, that is, there's no uh, a shortage of news out there uh, right now, and it's a very, uh, I would say very dangerous time, but also a time of opportunity. Um, the JCPOA, it's no secret I, I was against it from the beginning because it didn't have certain elements in it, particularly uh, the inspections. Um, anytime, anywhere, if you can't properly inspect, it's hard to know what's happening. Uh, secondly, the ballistic missile capability, which Iran has ramped up since uh, the agreement was signed. Uh, they had 15 UN Security Council violations by launching these missiles, so we've had seen uh, violations. And it didn't uh, end their nuclear program. It, it, in fact, guarantees that by 2025 that we will have a nuclear Iran. So in respect to what the president did, I sat down with the State Department at the time, the E3, that's mm -hmm. uh, Germany, France, and Britain, were working on these three areas, that being uh, ballistic missile capability, uh, inspections and sunset. When Macron uh, gave a speech to the joint session, uh, we were very encouraged to hear him voice his uh, commitment to those three areas. Um, I think what word that it got uh, tangled up was on the sunset provision, mm -hmm. particularly with Germany. Um, and I think what the president's doing is putting sort of maximum pressure, just like he's doing on North Korea. It's a 90 day period with the first sanctions and then a 180 day period uh, before all sanctions are, are lifted. Um, yeah, I visited a lot with President uh, or Prime Minister Netanyahu in Israel. He considers this to be his number one threat, not ISIS, who I've been tracking for mm -hmm. tenure in my chairmanship, but rather this empire, foreign adversary next door that, that um, has taken what he calls the Shia Crescent 
and that is Iraq, uh, Syria, and Lebanon. And we saw just recently they launched 20 missiles into the Golan Heights, um, defeating the Iron Dome, which mm -hmm. is what they're very, very concerned about. Mm -hmm. Uh, they believe that this was a bad deal as well. My instincts were on, in the last administration. I know that the intentions were certainly well uh, deserved, but it just seemed to me they just wanted a, a deal, mm -hmm. not the best deal that we could get. And I think it, it had certain elements that need to be strengthened to make it um, a better deal, and I think that's what the president is, is trying to do here. So are you... You see Plan B then as this is a move to try to force a deal. I, I see this as a yeah. I think Plan B is a a intense uh, negotiation, uh, 90 to 180 days out. Right. That's put maximum pressure to get uh, these key elements I discussed in the overall uh, plan. Now we had a foreign affairs hearing and I asked the panel of witnesses would Iran ever agree to this? Mm -hmm. But I think I think. I think they would because if the United States is out of this deal, it's very difficult for the whole thing to continue uh, with Europe uh, because then they're putting a choice between do I do business with the United States or Iran. So this is, um, you know, what you want to do is put uh, maximum pressure so your diplomats right. uh, can uh, resolve these, these issues, uh, not unlike what we've been doing, I think, somewhat successfully in North Korea. But in doing that, there's obviously the potential that you won't get a deal, that the Iranians will sort of follow the lead of uh, the Pakistani leader Ali Bhutto, who said his country would eat grass in order to get nuclear weapons. Uh, how do you deal, and how would you propose to deal with that potential outcome? You note that the uh, verification regime mm -hmm. in Iran is not ideal, but it's certainly a lot better, there's nothing, there are a lot of places we can go. Uh, we're at the risk of losing that and then, in that sense, losing sight into uh, what it is the Iranians are up to. Well, I think that's the greater risk, mm -hmm. right? The, 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 you know, we all have to be honest about that. Mm -hmm. That is, and I think, uh, I thought the president was going to extend the timeline on these negotiations. And he essentially sort of is with a 90, 180 day uh, timeline. Verification, I'm not so sure. I serve with Mike Pompeo. He's um, now Secretary of, of State. He. Uh, at the time was very concerned of our inability to inspect military sites where we know they would be conducting a lot of the research and development uh, for their ballistic missile and nuclear weapons uh, program. Um, you mentioned um, Pakistan. I mean, it's AQ Khan, interestingly, mm -hmm. Pakistan, who uh, mastered this and proliferated it to, to Iran and then to North Korea. And Iran and North Korea have been playing side by side. Um, this is a high risk game. And um, I, you know, uh, you want to be optimistic that the outcome is going to be a better deal with Iran and then we'll be able to, and working with North Korea, uh, ensure that neither one of these countries will be a nuclear power mm -hmm. because both of them create an existential threat to the United States. And I think North Korea's ICBM capability that they've demonstrated clearly shows that they are capable of hitting uh, not just Japan or South Korea, but uh, uh, this continent uh, as well. You have been pushing before the president's announcement for ratcheting up sanctions on Iran. You had, uh, you sponsored H.R. 4744, the Iran uh, Human Rights and Hostage Taking Accountability Act, which has mm -hmm. been uh, reported out of the committee. Yeah. Do you intend to continue with that, or has, has the president's decision sort of overtaken uh, that legislative effort. No, I, you know, I introduced uh, this bill which denounces the human rights violations in Iran, which are widespread. This is a very brutal regime. Uh, but they've also taken five Americans hostage. And so my bill will provide sanctions for anybody uh, that's involved in taking Americans hostage uh, in Iran. And I think you juxtapose that to what we just saw uh, with North Korea, where they released three American hostages. Uh, that should have been the game plan, I think, with Iran. I think the, fa the flaw of the Iran deal was we didn't get concessions enough before we released the sanctions. Remember, Congress had been working for years to get Iran, in passing sanctions, to get Iran to a place uh, where they would release our hostages, where they would denounce their ballistic missile program, and they would uh, denounce their nuclear weapons ambitions. And I don't think we got any of those. Well, let, let's stay on the nuclear topic and move across the world. Let's talk about North Korea. 
which you've already mentioned. Now, back in March, you wrote an op-ed uh, in which you listed all of the times in which the North Koreans promised to reform themselves and behave, and then reneged on those promises. Two days later, uh, President Trump surprised, I think, pretty much everybody by announcing that he was willing to go and meet with Kim Jong-un just this week. We've learned it's going to be on June 12th in Singapore. Uh, is it a good or a bad call uh, on the president's part, given North Korea's record? And just for the record, you, the title of your op-ed was, North Korea might negotiate in good faith this time, but it would be the first time. <laughs> <laughs> And I, I would like to quote a CFR document that really goes through the history of North Korea and how many times they've, they've played us yeah. in the international community in terms of you know, unfreezing assets to lifting sanctions. And every time we did that first before we had the, the talks. And every time they talked and then they later uh, resumed their nuclear weapons program and then also got out of the, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty which was uh, hugely significant. Um, do I think it's a good idea? Uh, this will be the first time a sitting U.S. president has met with mm -hmm. the, the, the Kim family, with one of the, the, you know, the presidents. Um, so it is, it's a big, in that sense, it's a bit of an accomplishment for mm -hmm. Kim Jong-un. Um, but I think when Mike Pompeo was dispatched on the same day of the Iran deal being revoked, it wasn't by uh, coincidence that those three Americans came home, it was by design. And I think what he told uh, the president of North Korea was, we need you to have good faith concessions before we even get to the negotiation table. So I think the three Americans being released was in good faith, but I, you know, to your point, uh, do have a healthy amount of skepticism. And I, th I think the administration's not, they're, they're, they're open-eyed uh, to the track record, you know, of North Korea. Let's not forget uh, auto, Warren Beer, who was released from North Korea as a student and then shortly died thereafter because he was so brutally treated uh, by the North Koreans. But, you know, you know the uh, axiom never uh, negotiate out of fear, but never fear to negotiate. I think they have sh so shown some good faith. They have stopped their um, missile tests. Mm -hmm. uh, we want them to shut down their nuclear facility. Um, the difference between the Iran deal and this, though, is that we, I think we have an administration that's willing to walk away from the table. With the Iran deal, I felt it was very much, we're gonna stay at the table till we get a deal, no matter what that deal is, just to get a deal. Well, let me ask you about that. What exactly is it that the administration should stay at the table to get? And, and I ask that because obviously the administration has taken a, a maximalist position. They want North Korea to denuclearize, right. get rid of all of its nuclear weapons. Uh, most of the experts I talk to follow North Korea, both here and in Korea, say the probability of that is vanishingly small. Many of them worry about precisely the point you raised in your op-ed, mm. that this has been a sort of long-standing gambit by the North Koreans, because among other things, President Kim Jong-un benefits simply from meeting Donald Trump. That, and, and some of the darker interpretation I've heard is that they took these people hostage precisely so they could give them up mm. uh, and satisfy the, uh, the need in the United States to see some progress. If we're not gonna get complete, verifiable uh, disarmament, is there anything short of that in your view is worth it while for the United States to accept well, or is it certainly all or nothing? Should be the, go the goal uh, certainly uh, to prevent them from becoming a nuclear uh, threat. I think the, the stakes are too high not to negotiate. Um, I think everyone, you know, we've experienced the last several months of fire and fury rhetoric and on the brink of a nuclear uh, ballistic missile being uh, intercontinental being fired. And uh, that got everybody a little uh, frightened, to be honest with you. I think the rhetoric has toned down, but this campaign of maximum pressure, I think is the right way uh, to do diplomacy. I'm a historically you know, Churchill fan. I think appeasement doesn't always win the day. I think you negotiate out of a position of strength. And I think what the maximum campaign pressure has done is put an extraordinary amount of pressure on North Korea with the sanctions. Uh, I had General, General Mattis uh, the other night. He said, we use our military, uh, extreme leverage with our military 
so the diplomats can work it out. But he knows Kim Jong-un, he's got the threat of sanctions, threat of a, a military provocation. Also, the key here has been China. Now, I don't normally say good things about China, but in this case, they've been very helpful. Well, I'm going to get to the bad things you say about China in a second. So. <laughs> <laughs> they've been very helpful in this case. They're in the only, really, the best position, because it's kind of like a bad stepchild next door. Right. That you, you know, they're your stepchild, you got to deal with them one way or the other. And I think they put a lot of pressure on Kim Jong-un. They, they want to maintain to see a communist buffer between the United States and South Korea and China. And so the goal, I mean, obviously, missile tests, uh, close the nuclear sites only for peaceful, and then full inspections. Well, the inspection Anytime. is going to be quite a challenge, just given we know very little about the North Korean uh, yeah. program. Yeah. Uh, what about the removal of U.S. troops from South Korea? You know, they've been there since uh, the Korean War. Uh, I think that should be an option on the table if we get um, these other promises. And I wouldn't do that. I wouldn't do any of this stuff. I wouldn't lift sanctions. I wouldn't pull troops out until we see those signs. Because in the past, we, l we, did, we can see it. And then they play this game mm -hmm. of waiting till another administration. Um, and you see where, where that's gotten us. I think it's been mishandled by previous administrations, both Democrat and Republican, where we've gotten to this point where it's a very difficult situation. Okay, let's talk about China now. Uh, you have written that uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping is, and let me quote you, exporting his brand of colonialism with Chinese characteristics through soft power means on a road toward achieving his hard power ends. Uh, are we doing enough to curtail what you call President Xi's long march? Well, he's, he's declared himself essentially the emperor of China for life. Uh, his, he has a very ambitious goal, the, the, the Belt and Road, where he's expanding into both Africa and, and, the, and the Latin American uh, hemisphere. Um, he is in the South China Sea, parading through the islands. Uh, they have very aggressive cybersecurity ambitions. Uh, they stole 22 million security clearances from the United States government, including mine and probably many in the room, with virtually no consequences to that espionage uh, action. So do, do I trust him? No, but sometimes you have to work with uh, people like that to advance your negotiations with somebody like North Korea. Uh, they're, they're really the only partner we have that can pressure Kim Jong-un. Um, but um, I, uh, I, I see the threat from there, you know, the cybersecurity stuff uh, is well, frightening. I, I, I want to get to the cybersecurity stuff in a second, but you raise, I think, an important point, which is that there are things that we are hoping the Chinese will help us with. We want their cooperation. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are obviously things we want them to stop doing, and so yeah. we're going to pressure them. It's not just in cybersecurity. Obviously, the president uh, sent a team to Beijing last week, which made a very big ask of the Chinese on the trade front. Right. Uh, and those negotiations seem to uh, not have gone terribly well. Yeah. Uh, just in your view, can you, can you, again, you sit on the Committee on Foreign Affairs. How do you think about how to weigh off or the trade-offs among those various priorities? Because obviously, if you could get China to force uh, North Korea to give up its nuclear weapons, that would be a major strategic success. Right. But I would imagine that Chinese, like most anybody, uh, would then say, now you owe us one. Well, I think that's where the trade deals perhaps could come into the picture, mm -hmm. that we're willing to make concessions on trade if you'll work with us uh, with the North Koreans. You know, I saw the rise and fall of the caliphate under the tenure of my chairmanship. Uh, and we finally unleashed the generals. We had the Kurds to defeat ISIS in Iraq and Syria. There's still a threat. But the bigger threat I see moving forward now are these foreign adversary nations, that being mm -hmm. Russia, China, Iran, and North Korea. And I think those, those states pose far greater threats to national security uh, than these one, two-man operations that ISIS uh, is sort of denigrated to. Let's talk about cybersecurity. Obviously, it's one of the issues that uh, the committee you chair mm -hmm. uh, has to worry about. Uh, it's pretty well established that the Russians meddled in uh, the 2016 presidential election. Uh, you've spent a lot of time being briefed on this issue. 
Uh, we are right now just a shade under six months out uh, from the congressional midterm elections. You'll be standing uh, for re-election. Uh, how uh, confident are you that we're not looking at an election Pearl Harbor in 2018 with mm -hmm. foreign powers, Russian or otherwise, interfering and in disrupting the actual counting of the vote? Because during 2016, it was manipulating Facebook, maybe probes of state yeah. voter rolls, but to our best of our knowledge, no actual manipulation of the data or the votes themselves. That's correct. And, and uh, when I got the Gang of Eight briefing in October 2016, very highly classified briefing on this, um, when it did become public and I could talk about it, uh, I immediately denounced what the Russians were doing, uh, said there should be consequences, uh, and we, we had to admit that it happened. Uh, what I didn't like seeing was a sort of a denial that it had taken place when the evidence, in my judgment, was so clear and convincing it was coming out of the Kremlin. And they did a campaign, a disinformation warfare campaign, um, that did not uh, impact the voting machines, uh, but it did have a lot of social media out there. They tried to do this in France, it didn't work. Um, with Macron, I was in Ukraine recently, uh, where they're constantly doing this. And they're also throwing every cyber tool, weapon they have, you know, into Ukraine. So um, I think it was important also to, to admit that it, it happened. Mm -hmm. Uh, the, and that Russia is not our friend, mm -hmm. and that there should be consequences to that, which is why we voted for sanctions, you know, finally, against uh, Russia because of that and what they've done in Crimea. With respect to the vulnerabilities and, and security of our next election, uh, I can tell you that the Russians are targeting uh, members of Congress, um, looking at ways to manipulate social media. Uh, that worries me personally. <laughs> A little bit, and, uh, but when it comes to the voting machines, most of them are not connected to the internet, and that protects them from that sort of uh, incident. But we did just pass uh, in the omnibus $380 million for grants for state and locals to help them with their election infrastructure. Uh, we also had a $30 million appropriation to the Department of Homeland Security. Uh, this is one of their roles they play as one of the Critical infrastructures, there are 16 of them, but the elections are now part of this critical infrastructure uh, that we are now working with the Department of Homeland Security to ensure that our elections are not in any way uh, manipulated. Uh, we're, I, I worry they can manipulate early uh, voting outcomes to try to deceive voters. If somebody's winning and you haven't voted yet, you may want to go with the winning person. And we also know that the voter data roles uh, were vulnerable. So they could go in and change, say, a, a name and an address, and then, and then basically uh, that, that person's voice uh, gets manipulated and, and the data has changed. That's probably the biggest weakness I see right now, and that's what we're trying to harden. Are, are there things that we should be doing right now? And I, when I say we, it's not just the federal government. In many of these cases, it's under the jurisdiction of state and local entities to take care of it. But are there obvious things that should be being done that aren't being done? Well, I think that uh, the, the protecting the, the voter uh, data right. roles is, is one of the keys. You know, uh, DHS can't mandate itself. It is a state and local uh, controlled. But we, uh, most of them have asked for assistance. We encourage them to ask for assistance because uh, the, the department has a lot of expertise. And I think, you know, with this grant program that we've seen, uh, of $380 million, um, you can see that Congress is taking this seriously. You mentioned a moment ago uh, the omnibus, and it's, it is good that Congress was able to pass the omnibus, but a lot of sort of old congressional hands sort of viewed the passage of the omnibus legislation as sort of uh, a great example of how Congress is not working the way it should. You're supposed to have individual appropriation <coughs> bills. The broader issue here about uh, Congress caught up in partisanship in gridlock. I don't want to idealize uh, the good old days uh, because throughout American history, uh, Congress has tended to often be quite lively. But you can look back during the Cold War and see times where bipartisanship uh, did win out. And I guess two questions come from that. Sort of what is it like operating in an institution where partisanship and polarization seem to be the overriding characteristic? 
And do you see anything that could be done to change that? Well, so my, this is my seventh term. It's been 14 years. I think this is the most polarizing partisan uh, I've seen uh, Congress. Uh, you're right, the omnibus, we passed um, separate appropriations bills in the House. Mm-hmm. Senate couldn't get their job done, so we, we get an omnibus spending bill. And nobody likes that, but we don't want to shut down the government mm-hmm. you know, either. Um, th- yeah, the trend, I think it's created by a couple of things. I think the, the internet, um, while it can be a very good thing, has actually polarized a lot of voices out there. I also see the media uh, getting more and more polarized. One channel is the, basically the, the, the far right view, the other channel is the, the far left view. And there's a polarization within the country itself mm-hmm. that we as representatives uh, represent that. Um, I don't think it's really healthy for the body politic, though, to have this. Um, and we have it within my own side of the aisle where we have divisions. Mm-hmm. And I, I always think it's better we can work this out. My committee, and I think any national security committee, uh, should try to avoid this instinct of being partisan. I think partisanship should stop at the water's edge. Every time we go in a congressional delegation, we are not Republican or Democrat. We are Americans representing the, the United States of America when we go over to foreign and countries. And that's probably the last vestige of bipartisanship you know, th- that I've seen. Um, you know, and it, these districts are being drawn mm-hmm. more and more to the left and the right. Uh, so I don't, I don't think that really uh, helps either. The voices are getting more angry, less civil. Uh, I think you can make your policy arguments in a very civilized tone without being, you know, this uncivilized, angry mob uh, mentality. I don't know how to fix it, to be honest with you, other than the fact that out of my committee, with the exception of possibly one or two bills, I try to pass my bills unanimously, mm-hmm. bipartisan. And then they, they go to the floor and, and they, have a bi- they have bipartisan support going to the floor. Committees like Homeland Security shouldn't, make this a part of, I mean, they're not checking our party affiliations, ISIS and Al-Qaeda. They don't care. They just want to kill Americans. So I, that, I, I think the chairman set the tone on their committees. I think Ed Royce and uh, Elliot Engel do a phenomenal job on the Foreign Affairs Committee setting that bipartisan tone of working together on national security uh, issues. And of course, the NDAA, which is the armed services, has always been a bipartisan um, document and agreement, and I'm worried that may be threatened uh, this year. The NDA being the National Defense Authorization Act. Yeah. I want to ask one more question, Chairman, and before I bring the restroom into it, and it ties back to where we began talking about Iran, talking about North Korea, and the strategy of maximum pressure. And obviously, when you think about that, uh, all options are on the table, which means among them the use of military force. Yeah. Uh, that gets back to a fundamental question about the nature of our democracy, our constitution, uh, which is that it is Congress's role to declare war, to decide when to go from a period of peace to a state of war. Uh, we've been under two authorizations to use military force, AUMFs, uh, one in 2000 with Afghanistan, one in 2002 about Iraq. Uh, there's been a lot of talk on the Hill about either updating them, repealing them, replacing them. Uh, none of that talk has led to any change because of disagreements about what should come after. Uh, in your sense, are we likely to see anything change in the future? Is Congress going to continue to sort of sit on the sidelines? Uh, is there a potential to craft some bipartisan compromise? Well, I think that um, it really depends how Iran and North Korea play out. I think the AUMF um, passed after 9-11, dealt with Al-Qaeda, but you look at ISIS, they were Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and it's radical Islamist terror that that AUMF was intended to cover. But if you look at um, Syria and Assad and chemical weapons, that's, that's not... Um, that, that's not, I, don't, I would argue that does not fall within that AUMF. Or if you look at Iran or North Korea, that does not fall within that AUMF. I personally believe that Congress has abdicated its constitutional Article I responsibility um, by not passing an AUMF. And it's not an easy thing to do, maybe that's why. But, you know, when they 
presented in a classified setting why they hit the chemical weapons, it's because under Article 2 of the Constitution, the executive, uh, the commander in chief, arguably has that authority. And this has been an ongoing discussion since the founding fathers about what do they mean by Congress has the power to declare war, but then the commander in chief has control over the military to make all decisions involving national interests and foreign policy. And I think that's why the War Powers yeah. Act uh, sprung out when they bombed the chemical facilities in Syria. We were immediately notified under the War Powers Act uh, of that uh, military action. Uh, but again, I think um, I would be open to entertaining that idea. Hopefully we won't have to with Iran and North Korea if we can negotiate a, uh, a settlement that is good for all parties. But wouldn't you want to negotiate one ahead of time? Wouldn't that add to the president's negotiating leverage that Congress is actually endorsing uh, his threat? And so we talked about this you know, backstage. I mean, if you think about it, if you really want to apply maximum pressure, you can talk about the military. Mattis can talk about that threat. And Pompeo can say, this is what we're going to do if you don't give this up. And uh, now we got China. But uh, wouldn't that be a bold statement by the United States? But people of the United States speaking on behalf of their representatives um, with an AUMF, giving the president authorized use of military force against North Korea or Iran. To me, that would actually, I think, give him more leverage uh, going into these negotiations. But I think the, then again, the counter argument for Congress would be once you delegate the authority, it's very hard to take it back, as we've discovered. And then you're uh, basically relying on the president to act the way you're hoping he would act. Uh, and presidents sometimes don't act the way members of Congress <laughs> wish they would act. I think that's a, one lesson I can draw from the little history I know. To uh, I want to bring the rest of the room into the conversation right now. Uh, if you'd like to uh, ask the congressman a question, pre please raise your hand. I want to remind everybody that this uh, conversation is on the record. I would ask the, that if I call on you that you stand up, wait for them to bring the microphone, state your name and your affiliation, and please ask a question and keep it short because I know there are a lot of topics I didn't get to uh, in this opening portion of our conversation. So we go to the gentleman back there. Thank you. Lucas Haynes, I lead the David Rockefeller Fund. Congressman, I appreciate your commitment to nonpartisan oversight of foreign and security policy. Secretary Mattis has testified about the impacts of climate change on national and homeland security. And my question is whether the committee you chair or the committee you serve on are working on the issue and, and whether you see nonpartisan interest in it. Well, it, that, that issue has gotten completely uh, politicized, as you know. and. Um, yeah, the question is, are we going through a, a normal Earth cycle, or is it, how much of this is man-made? Um, I had a briefing by these scientists from NASA, which was quite interesting. They're not political. They're just scientists, and they were telling me about the satellites and what they're seeing, and that the oceans are rising, temperatures are increasing. And I asked the question, well, how much of that's just a normal cycle the Earth goes through, or how much can be man-made? Um, his response that he thought like, these coal fire plants in China being lit up every week, mm -hmm. that, that this trajectory was going to be too intense for it not to have been, uh, had some impact from, from man. And so I think we got people like Mattis talking about this responsibly, but I think it's so, it's so politically charged right now that I think we have to take a step back and almost have a, a, a no pun intended, a, a cooling period uh, on this. But I, I think it's, it's, a, it's a serious issue. It's an important issue that I know the Defense Department's looking at in terms of uh, um, from a security point of view. Right here at the front table. My name is Lucy Commissar. I'm a journalist. And I ask you this question uh, as you are chair of the House Committee on Homeland Security. Um, do you have any concern about the Department of Homeland Security's participation in the surveillance, infiltration, and dismemberment of the Occupy movement, which was a peaceful protest by Americans, particularly critical 
of uh, U.S. Uh, financial regulatory policy, uh, something which uh, one would think citizens have the right to express themselves either individually or in an organized fashion. Well, you know, we have a First Amendment to the Constitution. People are uh, free to protest and speak their voice. Um, I, I'm not aware of any surveillance being done by uh, DHS on Occupy. Um, in fact, DHS doesn't really have those surveillance capabilities. It's, it's the FBI uh, that does. I'm not aware of the FBI uh, doing that, but I'd certainly be open to looking into that. Let's go to the back of the room. Yeah, I'm not, I'm just not aware of that. I mean, I, but I, I'm just honest. I, it has not been, certainly not in the jurisdiction I have uh, within the Department of Homeland Security. They, they don't uh, effectuate wiretaps. Okay, let's go to the back room. Gentleman there with, holding his hand up. Uh, my name is Greg Aftandillion. I'm a former IAF and I'm at American University. Uh, Congressman, I was wondering your views on the Yemen crisis. Uh, I mean, certainly Iran has had a hand in, in that crisis, but uh, the United States has been kind of indulging the Saudi war effort, mm -hmm. and there has been a tremendous humanitarian crisis there with you know, people facing famine, cholera outbreaks, and et cetera. Uh, what do you suggest the United States should do about this crisis? Um, and uh, do you think the administration is, should be trying to get some type of peace talks going? Thank you. It's a good question. So when Netanyahu told me about the Shia Crescent, he also included uh, Yemen. And remember, we, we, uh, we basically $150 billion now have been lifted. And since that time, Iran has spent 40% in, in military efforts. And we're seeing their movements in the Shia Crescent in Iraq and Syria, Lebanon with the, the rocket manufacturing plants. Gaza, and then Yemen. This is what the Iran deal has produced. A, I would say a more militant, uh, more money towards missiles as, as well. They, they've shot 15 missiles off. This provides more funding to expand their empire, the Persian Empire, into these areas. The rebel Houthis are in Yemen, uh, and you're correct, and they fired rockets into Saudi Arabia. Um, I can only imagine if our neighbor to the south was doing that to us, you know, how we would feel, or just like when Israel gets rockets from Gaza into to Israel. Um, but yeah, I think it's something that, you know, uh, part of a broader strategy, uh, I know that the State Department's looking at trying to resolve this as we discuss these issues with Iran, but it's a very dicey issue, and it's just, it wasn't the, the Saudis that started that. It was the Houthi rebels that went into Yemen and started to fire rockets. And it's a very aggressive Iran. And Iran is more aggressive and more uh, impactful, I think, because of the Iran deal. We'll go over here. You can arm wrestle for it. Who's ever more assertive? And you can We have a very polite group here. And Jeff, I can just, and that, thank you. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> if I can just add one more thing, I, I, I think when, I, again, the Prime Minister, it's amazing to see the Saudi, the Saudis and the Israelis actually form a sort of odd alliance. Mm -hmm. Who would think the Arab League of Nations would ever uh, be aligned with Israel? And yet it's the enemy, enemy, my enemy is my friend. So it's Iran that I think is driving that alliance, which I find fascinating from a foreign policy standpoint to see when I met with the Crown Prince or the Prime Minister talking uh, nicely about each other. Uh, so my name is Andrew, I'm a grad student at NYU. Um, my question, I'm gonna stay on the Iran train. Um, the Iraqi elections, I believe, are, are tomorrow, um, and you've talked about Iran's and their influence in the Shia Crescent. Mm -hmm. Where do you see Iraq going forward after the elections? And do you think uh, Prime Minister Abadi if he were to win uh, the elections, is still a valuable U.S. partner. Some people are beginning to question whether or not the U.S. can still rely on him um, in rebuilding Iraq and yeah. the influence of Iran. Well, and I've met with Abadi. I mean, he's, he's a Shia. Uh, we, when we started to see them rely on the Shia militias to 
uh, defeat ISIS because it's the only ally they had. They, didn't, they don't like the Kurds. So when they were bringing the Shia militias into Iraq, that, that's where I started to get a little concerned about Iran's further involvement in Iraq. And now, of course, they're uh, you know, in Syria and Israel just shot missiles at, at them just yesterday. Um, I worry about that um, election. Going back to Iran, though, I think the other impact that, that pulling out of the Iran deal is going to have on Iran is their economy. Uh, it's going to greatly depress their economy. They don't use the money to help their people out. They use the money to, to build rockets and to expand their empire, and they use it towards their you know, military purposes. I think the, the, the more it impacts the Iranian people, it, it's not that we're not against Iran, the Iranian people. We're against the Ayatollah. The Ayatollah that came in in 1979 and changed the, the region uh, to the present day. And I think that we missed a great opportunity with the Green Party in Iran. We could have stood with the Iranian people against this theocracy and this regime, and we didn't do it because we wanted to we wanted to have this deal. The deal was more important than, they didn't want to you know, hurt anybody's feelings by embracing the Green Party. Well, I think if anything could come out of this where the people of Iran could have an uprising against their theocracy, against the Ayatollah, and get a better form of government where they can be an ally again, uh, that would be a good outcome. Okay, we're going to go to your immediate left, and now you get a chance. I have to fight anyone. Mm -hmm. um, Willa Thompson, also an NYU grad student. Um, also thinking about North Korea and Iran together, doesn't uh, pulling out of the JCPOA telegraph to all future nuclear powers that they should only negotiate with the United States once they have a nuclear weapon? Yeah, and I, and I, I know that argument's out there. I, I would argue, though, also that... Um, it, it, again, it wasn't a coincidence that the three American prisoners were released at the same time. So that action, if anything, shows to the North Koreans, you know, that we're serious and that we, we're not going to take a bad deal like we did with the, the, the JCPOA, that we're going to, we want the best deal. And I think that's Actually, again, going back to maximum pressure and leverage, it puts more leverage on Kim Jong-un that, that we're serious about this um, and uh, we need results. Come down here right to the front. I'm going to try to get all over the room today. Uh, Rob Radke, Episcopal Relief and Development. Um, if there's a hallmark to this administration's foreign policy, uh, it's a move away from multilateral regimes into either uh, go it alone or bilateral. Mm. Um, and I wanted you to comment a little bit on that in general, but specifically our withdrawal from uh, the Trans-Pacific Trade Partnership and mm. how that might play into our ability to constrain China in the region. Yeah. Well, I think, I mean, he views it as I want one-on-one -on -one trade deals. I don't want to... Uh, he being President Trump. The President. I don't want to be held hostage uh, all but, these other negotiations going but, on. I mean, you know, I, I, um, I, mean, I, I understand what you're saying. Uh, I will tell you, in the Iran uh, situation we're in today, we, we really do need our allies uh, to help us. I mean, this, this, you know, this will not be a one-on-one -on -one negotiation with Iran. We need the E3, and we need the European Union uh, to help us leverage these negotiations to get to the point where we need to be. So um, I, I, think, I think John Bolton talked about this as well, as how important uh, the European alliance is in this negotiation uh, process. And, uh, Do you worry at all that our closest friends are reading this president's decisions over the last 16 months and concluding that he's not interested in their opinion? I mean, it seems to me that there has been a succession of uh, efforts by the Europeans first to keep uh, the United States in the climate agreement. That didn't happen. Yeah. Try to persuade the president not to move the embassy to Jerusalem. That didn't work. Very high profile efforts by Chancellor Merkel, President Macron, uh, to persuade the president not, not to leave the Iran nuclear deal. He did anyway. I mean, when I, when I talked to at least some Germans, Brits, uh, and French analysts, they argued that the message being read in their three capitals is that 
they can't influence this in administration. Yeah, and and I and look, I, you know, there is uh, some, there's some. It's intense. Uh, mm -hmm. There's intensity out there. Uh, I know. I mean, Macron had a, an excellent visit with the president uh, when he was mm -hmm. uh, uh, after the State of the Union. And he got a very good reception when he gave his address to Congress. And I, it, I frankly, uh, both sides of the aisle stood up and applauding him probably more than the State of the Union. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I mean, we had a, a very good uh, response to what he was saying, including his agreement to the three principles we, we, mm -hmm. you know, we talked about. Going back to the, um, the Iran situation, I, I was worried last, you know, during the last administration that we were so willing to embrace Iran and appease them to the detriment of our allies and our traditional allies, especially Israel. Mm -hmm. Uh, that in doing so, we were telling Israel, and, and I heard this when I went to Israel many times, you know, from, from the Prime Minister and, and members of the Knesset and, and others. And so um, the Saudis, you know, thought we were embracing, they didn't understand that. Um, I can understand negotiating, but not to uh, go through the appeasement. I mean, I saw my dad's generation. World War II, I saw what Churchill... He was bombardier in World War II. He was a bombardier in a B-17, part of the D-Day air campaign, and you know, I studied what Churchill, what Hitler did. Appeasement didn't work so well uh, with Hitler, and I think that's an, a test of time. That you negotiate out of strength, not out of weakness. I feel like this Iran deal is negotiating out of weakness and not really as much out of strength. And I think that's what the president's trying to do now is negotiate... Uh, you know, out of, out of strength. One of the most powerful, and I'll not digress too much, but mm -hmm. to lay a wreath at Normandy and all the white crosses and they play taps and then you see Omaha Beach and Point to Hawk was a very powerful moving experience. But then six months later to go to Auschwitz um, to see what they were fighting and the, the sheer evil and the horrors, you know, of the concentration camp and the gas chambers and Dr. Mengele, it, it's, it's um, extremely disturbing. And I tell my children that's only one generation away from me, even though for them it seems like, you know, ancient history. Yeah. There is a, the there's a new way. exhibit at the Holocaust Museum in D.C. It talks about America's uh, view and role in World War II uh, and, and, the, um, and, you know, the concentration camps. So it's really a very interesting wing of the museum. Okay, we'll go over here to this table. Uh, Dina Temple Raston with National Public Radio. And I wanted to ask you a little bit about cyber. And um, I wonder if you think that we need to change the conversation about cyber today. You've been quite clear here today that the Russians hacked the election. And our president has been a little more reticent to actually say that. And he has said that attribution for certain is impossible. But that's not really true, is it? It seems that we can do attribution but intelligence and cybercom think by telling us specifically about who is behind cyber attacks that somehow that diminishes their abilities. Do you think that we need to change this conversation so that all of us in the room have the possibility of clicking on something that ends up getting inside our companies? And this is a much broader conversation than what we're having right now. Right, so attribution, is, it's very important. Uh, and when you have um, a foreign adversary meddling in our democracy. Uh, I think that's one reason why that classified uh, report was uh, sort of made public to some extent because of what was involved. Uh, attribution's not always that simple though, but in, I can tell you in that case, it was clear cut. And sometimes we can't get the attribution right and you have to get intelligence as well as digital forensics to know where it's coming from. But this opens up on the Foreign Affairs Committee a whole new, there are no rules of the road when it comes to cybersecurity. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't have, uh, it's like a new frontier, a wild west. Uh, there's no international guidance. Uh, like say NATO, if, would Article 5 be invoked if a NATO nation was hit in a cyber warfare attack? A lot of unanswered questions. I had a bill to, to uh, create a secretary of cyber diplomacy in the State Department so we can uh, have a better uh, relationship with our allies uh, as to what the rules are and our adversaries about what the consequences will be uh, if you undertake this. If you steal 22 million security clearances, 
you know, if, if you meddle in our elections. But so far, I really haven't seen a whole lot of consequences for bad behavior. I've got five teenagers, and, you know, if there's no consequences, <laughs> bad behavior is going to continue. Um, and I think this is, this is an area that I find very uh, interesting because we are, you know, the, the legislature is always behind cyber because it's evolving so quickly. Um, so attribution, a lot of companies do it. Uh, they cannot hack back by federal law. Some of them would like to, uh, but it's, it's the role of the federal government to, to make that, that response. I mean, what I codified in 2015 were the roles of the federal government in cyber. The NSA is the offensive uh, and defensive in a time of war. The uh, FBI is the investigative. But the Department of Homeland Security is a civilian agency that we felt was the best place to share the threat information uh, with the private sector. And this is also in a post-Snowden environment. And that's been the construct that was codified into law uh, when my bill passed. Um, but anyway, I, I, I agree with you on the attribution. We'll go to the center table. <coughs> You still have your hand up, you get to go. Thank you. Thanks, I'm Todd Eisenstadt. I'm a professor at American University and a future IAF fellow working on climate change. And I wanna thank uh, the congressman for his moderate and uh, realistic remarks. And I wanna go back to a comment that you said, which was a quote, which was partisanship should stop at water's edge. It seems to be a quote that our generation understands well and it also seems that you have deference for the greatest generation, where they really understood that even more. I come in part representing students, undergraduates, who are coming of age in a period of polarization and fake news. Yeah. What they're learning is that politics is divisive, and that, in fact, opinions trump facts. And I'm very concerned that the answer to this that is being offered is inadequate. Um, it seems that in political science, we talk about redistricting and we talk about uh, primaries and partisanship as part of the, the solution. But whether that is or not, I think remains to be seen. It seems that sort of moderate and statesman-like members of Congress could do a lot more, such as sanctioning other members of their own parties when the tale of divisiveness and polarization seems to wag the dog of the U.S. role in the world. It seems like that's what's happening across the board. Mm. Can you comment on that and sort sure. of look for ways forward beyond just uh, having bipartisan mm -hmm. sponsorship of bills? I mean, it seems like we're in a bigger crisis here. Yeah, it's, a, Thank re you. it's a rhetoric, it's a tone. Uh, you know, when I grew up, there were three network stations and Walter Cronkite was the, gr the grandfather that everybody trusted. Bob Schieffer from Texas. Mm -hmm. I, that was my favorite show to go on, Face the Nation, with Bob Schieffer because he was like this uh, statesman-like, grandfather-like type that was always fair. Um, that's not the case anymore. Now we have all these cable shows, we have all this spin out there, and you got the internet where it doesn't matter if it's true or not. And in campaigns, you, you know, it's amazing what you see on the internet that has no basis in, in fact or truth. And I, I agree with you, it, it, it worries me about the students. Um, you know, Jim was at the, the LBJ school in, in Austin. I, I published a book called Failures of Imagination. It's what keeps me up at night, uh, eight chapters, including, this is in 2016, China influencing a, an election because I prosecuted the Johnny Chung case that was to the director of Chinese intelligence putting money in the Clinton campaign. Turned out, it t uh, about a year later, was Russia doing it. But when I, when I went to, they, they, they taught my book at the LBJ school. And I walked away, uh, had a great discussion. But the professor said, you know, none, none of these kids want to go into public service. And if we don't have, and that, that always, my dad inspired me, public service. I think leaders like Churchill and Kennedy and Reagan inspired me to get into public service. But if we don't have uh, a youth, of the millennials, having any interest in getting into public service, I, I, 
that worries me. You know, I mean, it worries me a lot. And even my own children, they, they, they like to stay out of it too. And, um, you know, it's a tone and the rhetoric. I don't know the answer again, and you, Jim asked me this question, or what we can do to, to bring the tone down. But I think, you know, a lot of it is, uh, well, the Internet's a great thing. It, it, it's also, it can be used by ISIS or Al-Qaeda or people that want to spread venom, political venom, uh, throughout the Internet. And you can't really take that off. You can take uh, some radical Islamist stuff off the Internet, but you can't, you know, freedom of speech protects this kind of rhetoric. I just would hope there'd be other leaders to stand up, and it starts from the top, to have the rhetoric of civility. You know, <clears throat> who would have thought that the, the statements are now by tweets? I mean, my, my, own, my own staff, they don't allow me to tweet out. <laughs> Chicken at three in the morning, so <laughs> that's probably a wise policy for me at, at least. But that's actually become for now a lot of electeds now. That's their statements. They, they tweet the other statements out. We'll stay at the center table since you were kind enough not to arm wrestle for the microphone. Uh, thank you, thank you, Congressman, for your uh, extraordinarily thoughtful, measured comments. Uh, you mentioned. Prime Minister Netanyahu about eight to ten times uh, as shaping your thinking. And you also mentioned uh, the new king, the, 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 the uh, Saudi uh, prince, MBS, uh, a couple of times. But in Israel, there are views on the JCPOA and the Iran situation, particularly in the Israeli military, the Israeli intelligence and national security world, which are supportive of the JCPOA. And our own General Mattis has testified in Congress and made a very forceful uh, uh, argument for staying within the JCPOA. I was wondering whether you could comment on how much weight should their perspective be on how we approach the situation? Right, and I'm not saying that uh, Netanyahu's voice is the only voice in Israel. It, it, it certainly isn't, and I, yeah, I saw Interestingly, Mattis, uh, we had that dinner the very night when, you know, this deal, uh, when the president pulled out, and he, he expressed his strong desire to be able to come back to the table to negotiate, and that we had a, a w window of time. Uh, he was disappointed that the E3, we weren't able to work out that agreement, and I think everybody was hopeful at that time that France was there. I think Britain, but Germany just wasn't there, and so... Yeah, I, th I thought we would have had an extension period, uh, quite frankly, where we can continue to negotiate with our allies and our European partners. Um, decisions have been made, and now you got the 90 to 180 day window, um, and the stakes can be higher. Go to this table right here. Yes, you're. This is the most polite group. Usually people are screaming, seizing the moment. <laughs> Sinem Sanmez, professor of economics at Baruch College. Um, do you foresee the U.S. troops staying in Manjib, Syria for a long time to deter Islamic extremism and the influence of Iran in the region? Thank you for your comments. It's a great question. I asked Richard, I don't know if he's still around. I, we talked about <coughs> this very issue. Uh, when I get briefed, I ask a question what are, what are our priorities in Syria? What are we doing there? Uh, the number one priority is to make sure that ISIS is never a threat to the homeland. Uh, and so that's why we have the Delta forces and the troops there. The, the also, the other goal is to prevent chemical weapons agents, you know, going back to World War I being used in violation of international law. And the third one is to help po provide political stability uh, to Syria. It's been a brutal civil war, massive refugees. Uh, th it's been the worst conflict, you know, of this uh, century. And uh, it's a very complicated issue because now you have the Russians in there. Remember they came into Afghanistan in 1979. Now they're back in the Middle East again. They have two ports in the Mediterranean. They got their sub submarine warfare. You know, submarines out there that can deliver nuclear weapons. 
They have stabilized Assad, which is what they wanted to do. And now uh, with the Iranians moving in, and then Turkey fighting the Kurds who we were fighting with to defeat ISIS. So you see, what it, this is the most complex foreign policy issue you could ever imagine. And there is no easy solution uh, to it. So when I was with the intelligence people, I said, um, so what do you recommend we do? They, they said, make sure ISIS is not a threat to the homeland, not to, uh, you know, condemn chemical weapons, and try to f provide some diplomatic uh, solution. Other than that, we have no friends there. We have no friends in Syria. Um, we did fight with the Kurds and the YPG, but again, the Turks think they're terrorists. It's a very, very difficult. So, in light of that, I think the, the, the days of occupying countries like Iraq and Afghanistan are over. I don't think there's any political appetite for it with the American people. Um, I do think a residual force is a good idea, but I wouldn't recommend escalating uh, that American presence. Chairman, can I draw you out a little bit on your comment about political appetite? I'm just curious. You represent a very diverse constituency. How much do you hear from your constituents about any of the issues we're talking about today? What are you hearing from? Or are they more focused on domestic issues, taxes, regulations, things like that? Well, I think, you know, usually the economy is key in, in elections. Uh, you know, we, we can debate the merits of the tax cut bill. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of my constituents like that. Uh, some, I understand New York, because you can't deduct your property taxes. <laughs> Don't want to bring up that ugly subject, but, but um, I am kind of, um, I do find it interesting in, in, in the level of interest in foreign policy matters because there's so many hot spots right now. Mm -hmm. And the thing, one thing that attracts me about potentially chairing the Foreign Affairs Committee is uh, we're moving from the, you know, this ISIS threat to a nation state, foreign adversary empires, Russia, China, North Korea, Iran. Um, to name a few. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'm, uh, I think there's a high level of interest uh, with my constituents about what's going on because this is about war and peace. This is about nuclear threats to uh, potentially the United States and, and others. Um, so that very much uh, gets their attention. Okay, in the back of the room. Hello, Congressman. Thank you for your remarks. I'm Imran Chaudhry from Pace University. Um, with respect to the issue of foreign intervention in U.S. elections, do you think Congress would consider investigating a move towards hand counting of paper ballots in public as a way, as is done in many countries, mm -hmm. as a way to kind of ensure the security of our elections, particularly with respect to you know these issues that might surround electronic voting machines? Thank you. Yeah, and, I, and <clears throat> so you want a redundancy in the system, um, whether it be electronic or paper. Uh, it's really, as Jim mentioned, this is more of a local, uh, state and local issue. They control the elections, not, not the federal government. But I know there are some states that, that are looking at going back to a paper ballot or at least a backup um, because I, I think it's important there be some redundancy uh, in the system. It, it's important to note, though, that none of the machines in the last election were impacted or tampered. Um, there's a lot of campaign disinformation, warfare, uh, that was out there. Um, but none of the machines were impacted. We want to make sure it doesn't happen in 2018. Okay, we have time for one last question. Ma'am, you had the last question. Hi, thank you. Aram Her, a faculty fellow at NYU. Um, we talked a lot about sort of the U.S.'s minimal line before it pulls back from negotiations with North Korea. So I have a very simple question. What do you think the minimal line is for North Korea before it pulls back again? Um, I do think that this time is a little bit different. It's been very orchestrated, very sequential. You know, he went to China, South Korea, and now he's meeting with the U.S. So clearly he wants something, and I, I, I doubt that it's just lifting of economic sanctions. And if it's something more long-term than that, you know, if you have any thoughts on what that might actually be. Well, <coughs> again, I think China's putting a lot of pressure on him. That's been very helpful. I, 
We'd like to see him join the international community, uh, and that would be economically. Uh, his country, I mean, they, they put all their money into the military, kind of like Iran, and the people are really suffering in North Korea. Uh, it's a brutal regime, and people are starving. And so um, I, had to be, I was a little surprised uh, when this sort of like kumbaya moment <laughs> occurred. I, I honestly didn't expect it. Uh, and I think that's because of the pressure that's been put on them. And I do think the sanctions have really uh, had an impact. So, but again, I would not recommend lifting the sanctions until we see good faith efforts on their part uh, to stop the missile testing uh, and to shut down their nuclear weapon sites. Um, anything short of that will ensure a, a nuclear um, North Korea. And we know their track record We've seen it many times in the past where they, they play this dance of negotiating and then they, they pull the rug out from underneath us. Is any congressional action required to lift any of these sanctions? Uh, we, we can apply, uh, but no, these are, um, yeah, we can't, we can't have, have some, right now we're not, but uh, these uh, sanctions have been uh, placed on them. Uh, I don't see in, any lifting of that. I, I would prefer to let the executive use their diplomatic and State Department uh, leverage to negotiate a, a better deal uh, before Congress starts to intervene and start you know, pulling off, pulling back the sanctions. Well, listen, this has been an absolutely terrific talk. I'm gonna ask the audience to join me in thanking Congressman McCall for being so generous with his time and insight. Thank you. Thank you.